Okay, so welcome everybody on our Thursday to this session on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance, which is uh, organized by a group of us, but it has the sponsorship from ICMRBS and Euromar. The goal of this series, as you know, is to present frontier research in magnetic resonance in focusing biological systems. And today we have a very exciting uh, session uh, with uh, Jennifer Matisse from Constance University and uh, Kevin Garner. So remember that the session will have a recorded kind of formal session. We ask not to record anything, it, it will be recorded and distributed. And then another informal, uh, informal session more open. In case that you had any question, please uh, raise your hand or type it in the in the question and uh, uh, an answer uh, uh, module and it will be uh, it, it will be <clears throat> uh, uh, answered by by the speaker that said it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the the first speaker of uh, of this session uh, which is uh, Jennifer Matisse from Constance University Jennifer did uh, her PhD at Leiden University in the Netherlands, uh, where she also uh, where she worked in. in uh, she also did her undergraduate in physics, and then uh, she moved to the MIT to do a, a postdoctoral uh, stay with uh, Bob Griffin for uh, about five years or so, and uh, and then she got uh, she got uh, to the to this position in the University of Constance, where she's now uh, an eminent uh, group leader. Uh, Young group leader, and uh, her interest is in EPR and uh, BMP, and uh, particularly in uh, in uh, iron containing uh, uh, proteins. And um, she is uh, going to talk today about the mystery of the double peak in the EPR spectrum of uh, transferring. So I think I don't share anymore. So um, today I, I would um, like to tell you about the mystery of the double peak in the EPR spectrum uh, of transferrin. But actually, uh, the first thing I would like to do is to introduce the transferrin family uh, of proteins. So uh, transferrins are found in all vertebrates uh, where they take care of iron transport and they make sure that the level of free iron in blood and also secretory fluids is kept at an absolute minimum. So uh, all, transferrins, all transferrins have two homologous lobes, uh, which are highly conserved, and they all bind one, they each bind one um, iron uh, ion in the high, ferric, high spin ferric uh, state, so that is um, iron 3 plus, in, in a deep binding cleft. Uh, the binding site, uh, the structure of the binding site is highly conserved. So there are always two tyrosines and aspartic acid, the histidine, and uh, a carbonate anion coordinating directly to the iron. And on top of that, there is an extensive hydrogen bonding network that surrounds the iron site. And in, in the figure here, you just see uh, the aspartic acid and the glutamate and a water molecule that play an important role in that hydrogen bonding network. So what is actually the most intriguing property uh, of, of transferrin is that it's able to bind iron very strongly at physiological pH, that's so pH 7.4. And the binding constant has been estimated to be uh, 10 to the power 20. So that's a really strong iron binding. However, um, transferrin is also able to readily release the iron in cells. So that's what you see here in this figure. So um, iron loaded transferrin is actually binding to a transferrin receptor and then anocytosis takes place. And upon the lowering of the pH, the iron is readily released to be used by the cell to be built into hemoglobin, for example. Um, the uh, transferrin protein is then released again fr from the cell and goes on another uh, route of gathering iron. So what we would like to do is actually to use EPR spectroscopy to study the iron binding site of transferrin. And specifically, we really want to look at the structure of the iron site and also at the electronic structure of the iron site to understand how it's doing this and why it's doing it in this way. So actually, the history of EPR spectroscopy uh, on um, high spin uh, ferric iron starts with this spectrum, which was reported by Schlichter and co workers in 1960. So, this is for the NMR spectroscopist, this is a very old fashioned CW spectrum where you sweep the field. And because you use field modulation to record it, what you're actually measuring is the first derivative of the, uh, of the absorption. 
So um, actually, this is a spectrum that was recorded um, of iron in glass at X-band. So that's a microwave frequency of 9.7 gigahertz. And Schlichter and co-workers, they describe the spectrum as follows. They say, we found a broad smear extending from an effective G value of 10 at low fields, so that's here, to above an effective G value of 1, somewhere here, with an intense and sharp resonance at uh, effective G value of 4.27. So actually, they correctly assigned um, this spectrum as arising from what we now call a high spin uh, ferric, ferric iron. So actually, um, high spin ferric iron has a spin 5 over 2. Um, the iron is a D5 configuration and an S ground state, which means that in the ground state, there is no in-state orbital angular momentum. This means that we expect a very weak or no G and isotropy at all. However, there will be a significant zero field splitting. And typically this is 10 to 100 or even more hundreds of, of gigahertz. What the zero field splitting does, it splits the six magnetic sublevels of the spin is five over two spin system into three Kramers doublets, which we call plus minus five over two, plus minus three over two, and plus minus one over two. So we can take the zero field splitting traceless, which means that we can express it in just two values, D and E. And, and the, the ratio of E over D always goes between zero and one over one over three, if you at least adhere to this convention for labeling the axis. If E, if e over D is zero, this means that dx and dy are equal. The tensor is axial, and in that case, the splitting between the Kramer's doublets is 4D, uh, 4D and 2D. If um, E over D is one third, uh, that means that dy and dz are equal, but opposite in sign and the tensor is called rhombic. So actually, if you measure high spin iron 3 plus at X band, you're in what's called the weak field limit. The Zeeman term is much, much smaller than the zero field splitting term. In this uh, situation, the spectra depend only on the ratio of E over D. And the reason for that is that with your small microwave quantum of 9.7 gigahertz, you can only induce transitions within each doublet, but not between the doublets. Each doublet has an anisotropy, which is nicely uh, plotted or, uh, with these so-called rhombograms, which you may have seen before. Right here on the x-axis, we plot the ratio E over D, and here we plot the G value, and here the behavior or the dependence of uh, the principal values of the effective G tensor for each, uh, each doublet. This effective D tensor actually incorporates the effect of the zero foot splitting into this value. So that um, there's the anisotropy is different for each of the three doublets. So these romograms are really convenient if you want to interpret such a spectrum as the spectrum show, uh, reported by Schlichter. Because now we know that this feature arises from the plus minus one over two and the plus minus five over two doublet. And we know that this feature here must arise from the plus minus three over two doublet with an E over D value that approaches one third. And for this reason, this kind of feature is also called a rhombic iron signal. Also, the smear, we can now make some sense of it because what it means now is that this spectrum arises not from a single value of E over D, but from a broad distribution of E over D values. And actually, this kind of spectrum is really typical for um, high spin ferric iron in amorphous materials uh, or frozen solution of chelating agents or proteins. So the transparent spectrum actually looks, very, looks similar, has similar features. There's the GS9 feature and there is the central feature around GS4.3 uh, and there is also the smear. And transparent has some other interesting aspect which to my knowledge is unique to transparent and that is that it has some structure. It has the double peak that I mentioned in the title and also a characteristic shoulder here. So what makes this all the more intriguing that this spectrum has been published uh, almost 60 years ago and still no one seems to understand what the origin is of this structure. To add to that, this structure or the splitting of these peaks and the shape of the shoulder is dependent on the type of transparent that you are looking at. So here I'm just zooming in into the GS4.3 region. Uh, for wild type uh, human serum transparent with two iron 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 ions bound. And also we have monoferric mutants where the iron binding has been disabled either in the C lobe or in the end lobe. And if you look closely, what you see is that this splitting is varying 
for this variance and also the shape of the shoulder. So it would appear that there is some structural information here. The question is just, what is it? So if you're an EPR spectroscopy and you see a, sp a splitting like this, what you would probably think, oh, that is probably an interaction with a nearby nuclear spin. So a hyperfine interaction. And if you... And actually this kind of spectrum is really typical for um, high spin ferric iron in amorphous materials uh, or frozen solution of chelating agents or proteins. So the transferring spectrum actually looks, very, looks similar, has similar features. There's the GS9 feature, and there is the central feature around GS4.3. Uh, and there is also the smear. And transferrin has some other interesting aspect, which to my knowledge is unique to transferrin. And that is that it has some structure. It has the double peak that I mentioned in the title and also a characteristic shoulder here. So it makes this all the more intriguing that this spectrum has been published uh, almost 60 years ago, and still no one seems to understand what the origin is of this structure. To add to that, this structure, the splitting of these peaks and the shape of the shoulder is dependent on the type of transparent that you are looking at. So here I'm is zooming in into the GS4.3 region uh, for wild type uh, human serum transparent with like two iron 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 ions bound. And also we have monoferric mutants where the iron binding has been disabled either in the C low or in the end low. And if you look closely, what you see is that this splitting is varying for these variants and also the shape of the shoulder. Jennifer. So it would appear that there is some structural information here. The question is just, what is it? Jennifer. So if you're an EPR spectroscopy and you see this splitting like this, what you would probably think, oh, that is probably an interaction with a nearby nuclear spin. So a hyperfine interaction. And if you want to is to change the microwave frequency at which you do your experiment. The field dependence, it should stand out even more at um, 9, 9.7 gigahertz. They're very kind to us and they measured for us the L-band spectrum that they measured and as you see, you do a hyperfine interaction. So what and actually focus on the smear. So I want to determine this distribution or measure it. Uh, it doesn't suffice to specifically what you want your field splitting. To. For example, you can do this at two. This is the spectrum that the metal plots you see. So clearly there's an enzymatic field with the increasing magnetic. So what we decided to do a little while and actually focus on the zero field splitting distribution or measure it at the red X band. You actually have to do specifically what why regular values, so you can the x and here you can determine the y. So this is, so actually this is something that a staff scientist in Leiden University instrument with a special probe uh, that wrote the solution of transferrin at a temperature of 10 parent and the two monoferric mutants. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry <laughs> for this interruption. Um, I hope it will not happen again. Um, okay, so um, I was um, trying to to uh, tell you why uh, I am interested in finding out um, what what's the cause of um, of the splitting in the X-band DPR spectrum of transferrin. And what you see here uh, are the, um, is a zoom of the G4.3 region uh, for wild type transferrin with two iron ions bound uh, and of two um, um, monoferric mutants where the iron binding has been disabled either in uh, the C lobe or uh, in the C lobe or in the N lobe. And what you see if you look closely at these spectra is that the splitting is changing for the different variants and that also the shape of the shoulder 
is changing. So um, the question is now, why is this changing? Is there structural information here? Can we use that? And, and then the question is how? So um, typically, um, an EBR spectroscopist who sees this kind of splitting will think, OK, this is probably a hyperfine interaction. This is probably interaction with a nearby nuclear spin. Um, so um, if you want to prove or disprove this hypothesis, what you should do is measure the spectrum at a lower microwave frequency, because uh, the term that um, describes the hyperfine interaction in the spin Hamiltonian is field independent. So if you lower the same on term, it, the splitting will stand out even more than it already did at 9.7 gigahertz. So actually, uh, Aaron Cattell and Bill Antheline at the Medical College of Wisconsin were very kind to us, and they measured for us the spectrum of transferrin at L-band, and that's a frequency of 1.8 gigahertz. So you see here the spectrum, and clearly there is no uh, splitting here. So clearly the splitting is not uh, a hyperfine interaction. So we then, uh, yeah, we were a bit disappointed, but we then decided to leave this problem alone and instead focus on the smear or on the distribution of zero field splitting parameters that we that is apparently there. So if you want to measure this or quantify this, it does not suffice to measure at X band. You need to measure uh, at much higher microwave frequencies such that you are in the high field limit. And actually, let me also bring back my laser pointer. Um, you need to be in the high field limit. So um, you, the same term must be much larger than the zero field splitting term. In this situ situation, which, for example, uh, is already working at 275 gigahertz, um, um, what will happen is um, it will be easy to read the zero field splitting parameters from your spectrum. And you can see how why that is from these level plots, uh, which show the behavior of the Kramers doublets as the field increases, and these red lines are the microwave transitions at 275 gigahertz. So I'm showing you three plots for the canonical orientation, uh, so that's the orientation or the direction of the magnetic field with respect to uh, the principal axis frame of the zero field splitting, so magnetic fields along Z, along X, along, and along Y. You said Z, then see this regular regularly spaced signals around the free electron value, which is of the G value, that's roughly around 9.8 Tesla at this frequency. And from this spacing, you can easily tell the principal values of the zero field splitting. So you can determine dz, dx, and dy. So we actually did measurements at, um, at high frequency. Um, at 275 gigahertz, and these are measurements that I actually did already during my PhD in Leiden on the home-built 275 gigahertz spectrometer with a, a, a probe that's specifically dedicated to CW spectra of, uh, of proteins. So it needs to have a very high sensitivity in order to measure the spectra. So this is, and this is a frozen solution at 10 Kelvin. So what you see immediately here, and again, this is the wild-type transferrin and the monopheric Newtons is that we can now distinguish the, the, the iron bound to the uh, N lobe and the C lobe by its zero field splitting parameter. So that, that's already a very nice result. But then if you look more closely, you see that there's more going on. For example, the width of the lines here in the spectrum for uh, iron C, so uh, iron only bound to the C lobe, which much smaller than that for, for the N lobe. And also, if you look here in the high field region, you see that there are not two, as you expect, but three negative uh, peaks. So this suggests that there could be multiple conformations of the iron bound to the envelope. So what would be really nice if you, if you had a way to analyze this quantitatively, to extract the zero field splitting distributions. And this was around the time that I was leaving for MIT to do my postdoc in the Griffin group. But this is the time that Mikhailo Azark actually joined the group as a postdoc. And together with my PhD advisor, Edgar Groene, they decided to take on this problem. So they developed a method for extracting the distribution of zero-field splitting parameters that they called the grid of errors. So this is how it works. So first you assume that every spectrum is a sum of many spectra with parameters di and ej. This uh, product here of CID and CJE is actually the, scale, the, the rating factor for the contribution of a spectrum with those uh, parameters of, or those values of D and E. So you then plot this starting distribution that you have, you plot it on a grid, 
and edge point on the grid contains the weighting factor. And also what you do is you compare your first spectrum, your first sum spectrum, to the experimental spectrum and you calculate chi-square, you calculate the error. So then what you do is you start to vary one by one all these weighting coefficients by adding a, a small constant, C0. And for every point on the grid, you now calculate an error, chi ij. So this gives you the grid of errors. So if chi ij is smaller than the original error that you had, then chi zero, then you incorporate it into a new distribution. Um, you then get a new sum spectrum called S1 here with weighting factors of each individual spectrum. And you repeat then this process in an iterative manner, and you can extract an optimized model-free distribution of the zero field splitting parameters. So actually, Mikhailo applied this to uh, the 275 gigahertz spectra that we measured. <clears throat> and here, for, again, for the monopheric Newtons, and you see that we get very nice simulations, and we can also now uh, reproduce the spectra in the GS2 region, which was pre previously hard to do. Here, there are the distributions visualized for uh, the iron bound in the C lobe and iron bound to the N lobe. And indeed, this, this shows immediately that the distribution is much wider for the N lobe and also that there is indeed a second confirmation. Here you see the numbers with the average D values and the width of the distributions. And what you notice here is that um, the values of D vary from roughly one gigahertz to uh, 11 gigahertz, but that the widths of these distributions are really quite large. And here there can be as large as three. So they're really large compared to the actual values of the zero field splitting parameters. You can repeat this game and actually we investigated a whole series of variants of transferring, of which I'm just showing you a few here. Uh, and actually you can now quantitatively start to interpret the subtle differences that you see between the spectra of all these vari variants. And what's also another conclusion that you can draw from this data is that it's not only the average zero field splitting parameters, so not only the average D and E, but also the distributions that are characteristic for a particular variant. So now we came at a moment where we wanted to submit the grid of error methods to uh, an important test. And that is the, or the question we wanted to answer, can the zero field splitting distributions that we extracted at 275 gigahertz reproduce the spectra uh, in the weak field limit? And actually they can, as you see from these spectra, which are again for one of the monopheric Newtons at X bands, and here at Q band, Q band is 34 uh, gigahertz uh, microwave frequency. So the simulation here in red compared to the experimental data, it matches perfectly, it matches really, really well. And also here at X-Band, we reproduce the GS9 region. We reproduce the smear, we reproduce the shoulder. So actually it looks really good. There's just one thing that is missing and that is the double peak. It's not reproduced by this distribution. So now um, there's really only one more possible explanation uh, that you can think of. And that is um, that what you have to do is you, right. So this slide, um, there's only one, Okay, then I, I, okay, good. But, um, in your spin Hamiltonian, so in the effective Hamiltonian that you're using to describe your spectrum, you have to include um, fourth order terms. And uh, we were really reluctant to do this because if you read the literature, um, these terms have been measured, but only on systems with very high symmetry and they were always very small. And, uh, um, with several orders of magnitude smaller than uh, the this, this second order terms. So here we're looking at a frozen solution with in addition a broad distribution of zero field splitting parameters. So it seems very unlikely that these terms could have an effect. Nevertheless, we were pretty desperate and we tried. So for the spin system, which has a spin of uh, five over two, there are actually nine fourth order uh, operators. Uh, and actually all here is are um, these operators of the spin operators are actually the extended Stevens operators. I will not bother you with the expressions. Um, suffice it to say that there are nine. Um, so actually what you see here uh, on the right is actually a simulation again of one of the monopheric mutants um, with uh, the distribution that we extracted at 275 gigahertz. And uh, one, of, one 
just one um, fourth order term, the term B4 minus three of 70 megahertz. And this is the first time that we were able to simulate the expand spectrum in a, in a way that covered all the features in the spectrum. So now I hear you think, okay, I'm skeptical. There are nine of these fourth order terms. Uh, there's a risk that you over uh, your system. And also, so now how does a fourth order term induce a splitting anyway? This is very curious, really. So actually, it turns out that um, the case of transparent net expands is somewhat special. Uh, and I can explain you why um, or how, what is actually happening uh, by looking at the anisotropy of the middle doublet, of the plus minus three over two doublet that's responsible for the signal around G is 4.3. So actually I've made some maps here and what these, these maps, you're supposed to read them just as you would read a map of the earth. So this is the equator and these are the poles. And actually this angle phi and this angle theta, they are the azimuthal angle and the polar angle. So what is plotted here now in or the color code is actually uh, the field position of the Y turning point uh, and here of the, of the X turning point and of the Z turning point. So if you're really in the high field limit, so the zero field splitting is much larger than the same on term, then this uh, anisotropy should follow this particular pattern, just following the programs that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. And you see indeed that this, this checks out with the Y being the, having the high the y turning point, having the highest field, and Z having the maximum field, and these are along the principal direction. Now, if you look at transparent and expand, the zero field splitting uh, parameter D is actually on the order of 10 gigahertz. So this means that the, the, the weak field limit is actually starting to break down. And this has the following effect. If you map again this anisotropy of the three over two doublet, what you see is that the Z turning point has moved away from the poles and is now happening somewhere halfway the northern and the southern hemisphere. So actually now it turns out that these fourth order terms in this particular situation have a profound effect on the spectrum. And actually there's one in particular, the B4 minus three term that has an even stranger effect. Um, and actually you see what's happening here that um, there are now these turning points, they, they have a different color. So this one is very dark. And this one is somewhat lighter blue, meaning that they have different field values. So it's actually the Z turning point that has split into two turning points. And this splitting is also is proportional to the value of this term. So this is actually the, the explanation. It's, this is actually uh, the origin of uh, the splitting in the expand uh, spectrum of uh, transferring. So now this is all very satisfying if you were a spectroscopist. So we were very happy that we finally could interpret our spectrum. Um, however, I think that if you take a bit of a distance uh, from what we've done, you look at this from a bit further, I think that we've accomplished more than that. Uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that what we would like to do is we would like to use EPR spectroscopy to study the structure and the electronic structure of the site. And I think that, um, well, I can, I can generalize that, uh, making a statement that I think that multi-frequency EPR spectroscopy has the potential to become a powerful tool to investigate the structures of high-spin iron-3 plus sites in proteins and enzymes. This hinges, however, on three important things. So the first is you need to be able to measure the high frequency EPR spectra. And I didn't really discuss this in view of the time, but um, it's actually not so trivial to do this. And there are only a few, a handful of specialized labs with dedicated instruments around the world that can, can really do this. Nevertheless, I've shown you the spectra. This can be done. We can tick this box. So yeah, I was wrapping this up. Um, so yeah, the progress towards um, realizing um, EPR uh, spectroscopy as a tool to study the structures of high spin iron 3 plus sites in proteins and enzymes. Um, well, we've, we've covered the first hurdle, um, which is that we can measure the high frequency EPR uh, spectra. So that's why this is ticked already. And the second important thing that we need to be able to do is that we need to be able to completely uh, and quantitatively also analyze the recorded EPR spectra in terms of the spin Hamiltonian parameters and their distrib distributions. 
So I can tick that, that, that box again. I hope that with my talk today, I've convinced you that with the grid of errors, we can do this. Um, then there is the third point. Um, so we, what we would like to do is we want to translate the spin Hamilton and the parameters into a structure or electronic structure of the site. And this requires advanced quantum chemical calculations. And a quantum chemist will tell you that calculating zero field splitting parameters uh, from first principles is really, really very difficult. Um, actually, we tried into a structure or electronic. We tried in collaboration with uh, Dmitry Bikov, who was at the time at uh, Aarhus University, um, and we used the ORCA uh, suite uh, to, um, to, to do these calculations, but we gave up. Um, even by a small, small change in the level of the theory, uh, the results or the outcomes of our calculations would change so much and in a way that was made no sense. So we just decided, okay, no, these calculations are just not yet reliable. So this is something that is still open This to do these calculations, but we gave up. Um, but even by changing the level, there are some interesting maybe starting points or new information there that can maybe help to also improve these calculations. And there are three things on my mind in reliable in particular. And the first thing is that what we've seen is that the distributions of the zero field splitting parameters are really very large relatively to the values of the zero field splitting parameters. So maybe if your calculation has trouble calculating these values precisely, that's not because your calculation is flawed, but that's just because nature itself displays a large variation in the zero field splitting parameters. And then the second point is that as I see it, the zero field splitting distribution reflect the energy landscape of the iron site. So maybe this helps to get another sort of calibration for your calculations. Not only do you have to predict the average zero field splitting parameters, and then this, but you also have to be able to predict the distribution of uh, the zero field splitting parameters from the calculation. And then third, um, the fourth order terms. Um, really, it's not been shown before that they play a role or stand out in a complex system like transparent, which has no symmetry at all. So perhaps we should start thinking more about the role that these fourth order terms can play um, in the interpretation of the spectra, but also in the calculation and think about what their physical meaning could be. So with that, I come to my acknowledgement slide. Um, I hope, um, I, I believe that I have acknowledged that most important people contributing to this work. Uh, so with that, I come to my acknowledgement slide. Um, I first of Vermont who prepared the transferring uh, proteins for us. As a task that's actually not so easy because these need to be expressed in baby hamster kidney cells. So um, I would like to thank her a lot for, for doing this uh, so skillfully. Um, with that, I would like to thank you for your patience. <laughs> I'm sorry for the, for the interruptions. Um, thank you for tuning in. I, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. I, I also uh, remember you that uh, please write your questions. Do it now while Jennifer is with us and uh, we'll try to answer them. You never know, yeah. <laughs> so there, there, are, there are a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is uh, like uh, from an anonymous attendee is that how can you have only one love bound to iron 3? Are the KDs for iron 3 different between the two lobes? Is, is you never know, yeah. In the chat, or uh, you, your question is how do we make the monopheric versions of transferring? That's the question, correct? I, I guess the question is how is that is possible that this this uh, this species exists? Yes. So uh, it's very simple. You just make a mutant where you disable the iron binding in one of the lobes. So you just, of course, as I, as I said, there are these four residues that need to be there to enable the binding. So if you just remove one of them and replace it with alanine, for example, but then you disable the iron binding. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But uh, related to this, I, I believe that those three species have biomarker value and uh, your, your spectra show that you can differentiate that. You, you, can, have you thought of that? I mean, this is a very unrelated question. I know that you, your interest is completely on, on the convolutin and understanding the spectrum, but, but transferrin is tightly regulated and uh, the amount of iron and its depletion, it's a symptom of anemia. 
and uh, have you thought about any use, a medical use, to, to measure the, the amount of iron or, or just by, by measuring the spectrum on that? Is, is that makes any sense? Um, well, with high frequency EPR, you could start to do these things. Yes. Yeah. I guess that you should provide that from the, from the blog or something like that, but still. Okay. So there is another question, uh, like, have you tried to make the calculations quantitative? Meaning that you get the spectrum of the naive two lobe protein from the sum of the two separate lobes? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I didn't show that in my slide. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so actually it's roughly 50, 50. Yeah, yeah, as it should be. Yeah. Okay. Oscar, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, I I didn't show that in my slide, but um, yeah. So actually, it's rough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you say some? Can you say something more about yeah, yeah. the grid of errors? How overdetermined is the problem? How many parameters are getting fit? Do you have to use any kind of regularization? It, this is actually, I, to my understanding, somewhat similar to methods that are also used in analyzing deer bases. Yes. Um, so, um, but over-parameterized, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Do you, do you mean in how much guidance does the process need? Or? I mean, is there a sense of um, how many degrees of freedom you have at the end of the day? You know, how many... What's, how much information is it, the spectrum relative to the number of parameters that you need to fit on the grid? Um, so the only thing we are changing are the weighting factors. And um, we trust that's the only thing we are changing. So um, yes, we change all of them. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure. So, but you're not changing the, the, the spectral parameters. So actually, if, before you start, you calculate the library of all these spectra, and then you just find the appropriate weight. Right. Uh, so and we, then we just let the algorithm do its thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. And how dense is the grid? How many weights are there in the final model, typically? Um, this actually depends a little bit. So it's actually uh, because, the uh, yeah, you have to, well, so what you have before you start, you have already a pretty good idea what the average uh, value of DNA is, because this is something that you can easily derive from the spectra, and this is also pretty reliable. What you still need to get is this optimized um, distribution. So, um, yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Okay, so any other question from the audience or from the panelists? If that's not the case, uh, thank good. you, Jennifer, again. Uh, I mean, thank you also for the extra effort on, uh, on these difficulties on the, on the internet connection. And I, I just pass the microphone to Art to introduce him. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. So it's a real pleasure to introduce my New York colleague, Kevin Gardner, today. Kevin was a graduate student at Yale University in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, receiving his PhD in 1995. He then moved to the University of Toronto to Lewis Kay's lab, where he was one of the pioneers developing what are now incredibly important methods in NMR spectroscopy around deuteration, um, deuteration of methyl groups, ILV labeling, and all the associated NMR techniques that we all make use of. In 1998, he moved to UT Southwestern Medical Center as an assistant professor, rising through the ranks, becoming full professor in 2009. Fortunately for all of us in New York City, in 2013, Kevin moved to New York to become the director of the Structural Biology Initiative at the City University of New York Advanced Science Research Center. This was, is a new research center in 2013 that's located across a small grassy field from the New York Structural Biology Center, which is where all of the NMR spectroscopists in New York City go to use 
machines from 700 megahertz and up. So for the past seven years, Kevin has been a really outstanding colleague in New York. He's one of the people you can email at 11 p.m. and say, I need a research description by 8 a.m. in the morning, and it'll be in your mailbox by 8 a.m. His, his work, which I'll tell us about today, is been focused on protein-protein interactions, and particularly in families of proteins that take external inputs, whether it's light, oxygen, or voltage, and then transduce those to downstream effector proteins. As you can tell from his, his title, he's also always interested in bringing physical chemistry methods, whether it's light-driven or pressure-driven, and no doubt something new in the future, into his applications, and that's what he'll tell us about today. So, Kevin, thanks. I don't, I think you're in your office. I happen to be a mile away from my, where I got my PhD in North Carolina right now. So, it's good to see you, and thanks for the lecture. Thank you, Art, for the very generous introduction and the hypothetical of the uh, 11 p.m. email with an 8 a.m. deadline attached to it. Uh, thanks to the organizers for um, the chance to be able to get together in the midst of uh, some truly strange times and share a little bit of science. All right, as Art mentioned, um, since 2013, my lab's been located at the building on the left here in New York City, New York Structural Biology Center, our very close partner with people like Art. Uh, right next door across this grassy field. And what I'd like to be able to do is, for the next few minutes, share a little bit of the work that we've been doing here uh, to take a look at some of these questions, as Art mentioned, really focusing on trying to understand how biology has built sensors for everything from blue light to oxygen to pollutants in the environment around, uh, around them. This has really been a very fun set of work to do, very interdisciplinary, a lot of NMR spectroscopy, but complemented by a lot of other biophysical and biochemical and cell biological approaches. As I was mentioning, our group is interested in understanding how organisms across biology have built protein-based sensors to monitor various environmental stimuli from light to oxygen to environmental pollutants to others using an integrated approach with a lot of NMR spectroscopy, but a lot of other biophysics, biochemistry, and cell biology methods. And out of that, what we've been able to develop are tools in two general areas. One have been a series of biotechnology tools over in the area of optogenetics. So taking natural light sensors where information about um, nearby blue light is converted into a change in a chemical bond within a photosensor, for example, shown on the left, letting us build novel tools for biochemistry and cell biology. The other area that we've really pushed on have been natural oxygen binding proteins, especially from the human system, HIF, hypoxia inducible factor system, where nature has left us a nice cavity within the middle of the protein that's been amenable for small molecule intervention, which has led to tool compounds for cell biological studies, animal studies and now uh, rapidly heading towards the clinic um, as being commercialized by Merck as an outcome of our work uh, as novel anti-cancer therapies. So summarizing that work, we've been able to take what are protein-protein interaction domains that can be triggered by a change in either occupancy of a ligand or a configuration of a bound ligand. We affect function. And again, this has led to novel therapeutics, for example, now being carried on by Merck over in the HIP system, or led to novel biotech tools such as optologics. So the topic of today's talk is high pressure MR. How can that contribute to anything in this specific area? Can really do so in two ways. What I think we've been able to identify in our work so far with these natural sensors is really the tip of the iceberg, not only within the specific domain family where we've worked, uh, but within literally many others. So how can we, out of literally thousands of targets available, go through and rapidly identify which of these may be more or less amenable to natural or artificial ligand regulation? High pressure NMR, I argue, has a really important role to play here. More on that as we go through the talk. The other area that we're really interested in is obviously what we're doing with the small molecules as shown as above are usually affecting 
pre-existing conformational equilibria. We'd like to be able to rapidly and easily change those equilibria, not just the set point of the position, but also we're curious at looking at the intermediate state here, the transition state. And all these question marks are involve a lot of states that are invisible to see by normal uh, NMR spectroscopy and other biophysical approaches. And I assume that a high pressure NMR has really become an increasingly important uh, component of our research program to try studying these directly. So I appreciate that we've got some experts in high pressure NMR on the uh, but we also have a lot of people who aren't used to thinking about this. So a brief primer into this. So first of all, high pressure favors conformational states of proteins and other macromolecules with smaller volumes. Uh, a delta G term comes into play, which is dependent both on pressure and change in volume between states. Um, many systems respond to pressure by a general compression. There's an overall and quite small isotropic compression of the system that one can see from changes in chemical shift and most other metrics. But there can also be ensemble-based approaches as well, where, for example, if a protein is undergoing a change in conformational state in a pre-existing equilibrium, pressure will favor the formation of the smaller volume state. You'll see a shift in the equilibrium towards that. And we're going to take advantage of especially the second of those two, Part B, and some of the work I'll discuss, before, or we'll discuss later. I'll note that unfolded conformations tend to have the smallest volume of the system. Um, so there's been really elegant work by many people in the field taking a look at pressure dependent unfolding processes. We're going to apply lower pressures uh, than this in most of our work that you'll see following. And again, this is an area that has a really wonderful and rich set of biophysical measurements that have been associated with this, especially in MR, including fantastic work done by people like Kazu Akasaka, Kathy Royer, Josh Wand, Hans Robert Kalbitzer, and others. Um, and I'm going to try giving a shout out to some of those as we go along. Uh, by the way, I'm seeing a chat uh, note on the question. How's audio doing? Is it clear or not clear? There's some yeah. staticky background for some reason and you get interrupted yeah. a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna try. Let me try changing. I'm gonna go over to a different microphone do you, another, do you have another microphone maybe because i think yeah, it's i just switched i just switched over to that christian this is a new microphone now i don't know that sounds better okay i'll leave it at that thanks so those are what we hope to get out of high pressure nmr let's then also get into some introduction of units and the parameters we can affect here so the si unit of pressure is the pascal um, what we're going to be talking about much more commonly here is one bar, which is 100 kilopascals. And nicely, one bar is approximately equal to one atmosphere. So if we think about how we could do a high pressure NMR experiment uh, and calibrating this in terms of uh, physical parameters we can see in the day-to-day -day world, I'll underscore that uh, if we go into the deepest of the oceans, for example, the Mariana Trench out in the Pacific, we're going there to a depth of approximately six miles. That's a pressure range of about one bar, one atmosphere at the top, up to about 1,100 bar at the bottom of the deep. Uh, what range do we need to be covering? Well, ideally, if we're interested in studying protein folding or unfolding processes, we're looking to hit three to four kilobar or higher. So that seems like we have two options to do high pressure NMR experiments. One is to take a ship out here and throw an NMR spectrometer down to the bottom. I might suggest one vendor in particular as being useful for such experiments. But thank goodness that a variety of commercial options that don't involve destruction of an NMR spectrometer have been developed. I'm showing some here from a company that Josh Wand established, Dataless Innovations. And really, it's, there are two components here. One is a high pressure NMR cell that can withstand pressures uh, up to 2,500 bars, so getting very close to those ranges that one would want to be able to study for protein unfolding events. Uh, this cell is connected by uh, stainless steel tubing over to a pump, and this is all commercially available, which has really um, made a, a variety of groups, including my own and NYSBC, able to undertake experiments along these lines. Um, I'll underscore two specific aspects of this that are worth knowing for people who are not in the field. Number one is obviously this is not a standard glass five millimeter tube. 
It has significant uh, size to be able to withstand pressures. So the tube has a reduced filling factor, effectively about a three millimeter inner diameter, which reduces filling factor and impacts signal to noise, but uh, not significantly enough for us to not be able to do any of the traditional suite of high resolution, high sensitivity NMR experiments uh, that we're all familiar with. Additionally, pressurization from the pump going over into the tube here is uh, managed by liquid for compressibility reasons. Either water is being used with a hydrophobic plug of some kind or another between the pressurization fluid and the sample, or a variety of workers, including at Bax and, and others with some of the devices they've generated, are just using a hydrophobic fluid on its own. Okay, so that takes care of the pressure side of things. Let's briefly introduce volumes. So if we're going to look at a molecular level, we need to be thinking about cubic angstroms, which is 10 to the minus 24 mil. So putting that into the real world is a little not so useful. At this point, I'm quietly sipping here off to the side 10 to the 25 cubic angstroms worth of espresso while I'm giving this talk. Better to calibrate this than our water, glycine, and tryptophan as molecules that we're all much more familiar with. 30 cubic angstroms for water, 60 for glycine, and 230 for tryptophan for the amino acids. A little bit of definition in my talk and others, you're going to hear a little bit about cavities, which are open volumes of 30 cubic angstroms or greater. Voids are those same cavities and smaller defects of packing, for example, within our protein, each of which we think are quite important. And nicely, there are a variety of ways that one can study cavities or predict cavity size computationally from pre-existing structures. Actually, as my crew and others have gone into this field, I've been surprised how different results are from different computational approaches on this. I'm actually, um, in the work that I'll talk about here, we're going to focus more on voids, which cover both cavities and these smaller cavities, or cavities and smaller defects of packing. And I'll note a very nice computational and very trivial to implement and understand approach by George Makahatsa and coworkers to calculate the voids, basically just take your protein of interest roll a solvent molecule around it and take that enclosed volume, that's going to be V solvent here, then take the sequence of the protein, sum up the volumes of the amino acids, that becomes sum of VAA, and what's left has got to be your voids, just the difference between these two. It's very rapid, it's very easy to understand and very reproducible in our hands. So that's how we'll be generating void volumes later. Okay. So the, enough introduction. That's why we want to do high pressure NMR that calibrates us a little bit with pressures and volumes. Let's go put this to use. So the first of the two areas I really want to talk about then are this question of prioritizing among these thousands of potential targets, small molecule regulated protein-protein interaction domains. Where do we start for looking for natural or artificial ligand regulation? And with that, that gets us over to introduce the hypoxia-inducible factor HIF system, which has been very well studied within parts of the cancer community in particular. It was recognized by the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine by, uh, for Greg Semenza, Peter Radcliffe, and Bill Kalin, each of whom were responsible for discovering large swaths of what's shown on this slide here, the fundamental biology of HIF. It's a really elegant and uh, beautiful system to be looking at in many regards from regulation. What I want to underscore here is that naturally what should happen is that you only want to form this heterodimer here on the bottom left when oxygen levels are low. Um, unfortunately, some of the mechanisms that are used to keep those levels of HIF low are defective in certain, um, with certain somatic mutations. If so, HIF is constitutively turned on, your body or your cells believe that at all points it's starved for O2, and that becomes problematic because the HIFs control about 200 gene products that are wonderful for addressing short-term needs for addressing, uh, for example, injury. But on the long-term, these are leading to overexpression of a variety of gene products which are tumor-promoting as well. And so what we, in this case, this is really a long-term collaboration between my group and Rick Bruick's group at UT Southwestern at the heart of this, and we'll introduce additional players in a minute or two, really want to go take a look at how the HIFs interacted with each other, and critically, how these protein-protein interaction domains known as PAS domains at the heart of this were able to interact as a potential route where we might be able to get some small molecule intervention to stop one of these runaway cells. So, 
As part of that, we used a conventional NMR structure-based uh, uh, or structure determination route. Uh, we used NMR-based uh, fragment screening and then began high-throughput screening, X-ray crystallography, and a variety of other approaches to be able to go take a look at these pieces of the HIFs and whether they might be regulatable by small molecule ligands. Really, this is work in my group that was pioneered first by Paul Erbel and Carlos Amesqua, and then uh, really pushed on and taken to completion nicely by Tom Sherman and Jason Key. What they found is that a piece of the human HIF2-alpha, one of the isoforms of the HIF, um, carries around with it a big bag of water. So there's about 290 cubic angstroms worth of cavity in the middle of the protein. I'm showing you here a high resolution crystal structure of ours with eight crystallographically ordered water molecules in the middle. And again, 290 cubic angstroms to put that into perspective is uh, big enough to hold about a glycine and a tryptophan worth of, of size. And we and others in the field have speculated that this is uh, a site for a natural ligand, which has not been well characterized by us or others. Uh, that didn't stop us from developing artificial ligands for this system, initially from an academic side of the operation, using high throughput screening, we could find compounds that would go into this cavity and reshape it, triggering an allosteric disruption of HIF function. That led us to uh, help establish a small molecule drug company called Peloton Therapeutics, work here, and it really nicely carried on by Jim Rizzi in particular, to go develop even higher potency compounds and more efficacious than we could develop in, the, in an academic lab. That work has now been, uh, Peloton was acquired by Merck Pharmaceuticals last year. Uh, there are now compounds that are advanced versions of this in phase three clinical trials. The FDA has recently approved this as a breakthrough drug. So um, I'm expecting that we'll see drugs targeting uh, a very difficult class to target, protein-protein interaction within a transcription factor that had its genesis uh, really in NMR spectroscopy. So that said, I think there are a few details here that are worth discussing with an audience like this. So first of all, that cavity that really inspired us to be able to go do the drug discovery, I've got to be honest, we did not see that in an initial high-resolution solution structure of this target. Um, there were some differences in sidechain rotomer location, and we also did not do explicit uh, water protein NOE refinements, such that the cavity itself and the structure that we got, which is overall quite similar to crystal structures, which we got later, there were enough small rearrangements in sidechain location that the cavity does not exist in our original solution structure. That said, NMR-based fragment screens told us clearly small molecules were going into the core. What we needed here and what is standard today for cavity identification is still really high resolution crystal structures now increasingly cryo-EM. But I think as we can all appreciate, these are time consuming and not always 100% successful. So we really wanted to see if there were ways that we could bring in high pressure, for example, to get us data even quicker to be able to assess whether a target was really worthwhile investing time and effort in or not. That said, even with the awesome power of X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM, they're still in a critical state that none of us have been able to see experimentally, which is that cavity I showed you before is completely internal. We have nanomolar potency compounds that need to be able to come in and out of that, crossing six angstroms of protein with no access in and out of solvent. And the only way we've ever been able to see any of those transiently open states has been computationally in some molecular dynamics work that we did together with Valerie Daggett a few years ago. As we and others have gone on through the field now, we're seeing as we get more high resolution structures, more and more and more cavities. But again, still, the, we're chipping at the tip of an iceberg here. We've got many more of these systems than in both human and in uh, a variety of other non-biomedically relevant systems that we're all interested in, either for intervention, for therapies, or to develop new um, small molecule sensors. So how can we go through and identify these targets and sites much more rapidly? And this is really work that's been carried on by a group of three people in, in my lab, uh, really pioneered and, and developed very independently by Donald Gagne, uh, then a postdoc in the lab shown at the top. He was assisted by Jim Aramidi, our NMR facility manager at the ASRC, and a graduate student, Roxana Azad, came aboard as the work was moving along from the initial start. 
And what they saw is as they've now gone through and applied high pressure and just done a variety of simple NMR experiments, nitrogen, proton, HSQCs, what you typically see out of the literally now 60 complexes and apoproteins that we've squeezed are a lot of behavior like you see on the left. As you apply pressure, you see linear changes in chemical shift. However, what we see for a fair number of the systems, especially the ones where we suspect ligand binding, we start seeing uh, non-linearities. And I'll remind everyone back from the introduction, what are the two ways that pressure can chiefly impact molecular conformation? One is by a general compression. That's what I believe we're reading out here on the left. However, in other cases, we can see a shift in conformational equilibrium. And that's what we're seeing over here on the right. This is not a protein unfolding event. Pressures are too low, amongst other things, and the chemical shifts are not heading towards the unfolded state. What we are seeing here is we think we're beginning to see transient openings of these cavities or, or voids in the system as the protein is rearranging with response to high pressure. So Donald went through and took a look at a variety of ways to quantitate this very rapidly. Again, our objective was to be able to go do analyses that did not require chemical shift assignments, that did not require triple or double or triple labeled samples. Let's keep it simple. And out of that, he was able to take these changes in chemical shift as a function of pressure, fit them to a simple three-term equation where we can pull a parameter here, CI, that's a coefficient showing the dependency of the chemical shift on the square of pressure, giving us this nonlinear term. We can simply plot those as a histogram. Again, no chemical shift assignments. We do not have residue specific information. This is an evening on the NMR with automated peak picking and, and analysis after the fact. And what Donald could see very early on is systems, for example, like our HIF2 alpha pass B system, which had a large cavity. We saw a broad heterogeneous response in these CI parameters with respect to pressure. However, when we would go apply high affinity compounds that would head into the cavity and reduce its volume substantially, we saw a much more homogeneous response. So Donald went through and took a look at a variety of statistics to quantitate this. We settled on standard deviation as we uh, go across these distributions here and looked at molecular features that these could correlate well with in the protein structure. And that got us back over to that void volume calculation from the Makatsada group that I mentioned before, where we could see nicely that the standard deviation was showing a decent and positive trend correlating with void volume, as we saw here. At this point, I really want to acknowledge some fantastic contributions, both in terms of data and ongoing discussions with Kazu Akasaka, who provided us access to some data that his group had previously collected on a number of proteins with high resolution structures that were well, uh, were well characterized. We took that list of approximately nine systems. We duplicated some of them here in New York to make certain that we were analyzing things equivalently. And we added in about uh, 40 more systems on top of it. We see some occasional outliers, for example, like lysozyme here, which we attributed this to being quite thermostable. But as long as we're not having systems that have unusual stability, uh, again, we see a nice correlation here. And notably, the systems that showed significant voids, substantial enough for small molecule binding in our work or others, tended to have values where the C value would go high above a fairly arbitrary, honestly, ar an arbitrary metric of, of 50 on this unit that we have here. So let's go take a look at one of these put to work. We'll start off again with that HIF2 alpha system. That's the drug target that I introduced previously. We know what the APO structure looks like in uh, quite a fair amount of detail. We know what co-complex structures look like in quite a amount of detail. We can take a look at these histograms, again, of the APO protein or of two complexes with high affinity ligands. And we can see that the addition of the ligands leads to narrowing of the response of these CI values. And if we simply plot the standard deviation here, we can see that we go from something with a large value, indicating a large cavity, over into things where we see a reduction in the response or reduction in the heterogeneity of the response, consistent with the protein now having a smaller void volume. I'll note there's more than one way to do this. We can go, exa for example, go put in artificial mutations into the system and reduce void volume but get something that doesn't respond naturally. We think that's telling us something 
about additional voids that are being generated. This D1, for example, is a Rosetta redesigned version of the protein, which we think is doing a good job emulating the overall structure of the ground state. But it's telling us that clearly some things in that first high energy state that we can access by high pressure are, are quite a bit different. If I just go through and summarize those data as we have here, we can now look at other systems. So for example, ARNT is another player in the HIF system, again, with small molecules present. And we can see that as we take a look at the APO value, this is consistent with voids that have been observed in high resolution crystal structures. And now we have some small molecules whose mode of action we don't yet know, we don't yet fully understand. Some of those as bound cause reduction in the CI value. We interpret those plus chemical shift data as interior binding. But some of those, while still binding perfectly well, don't cause a change here. Again, consistent with chemical shift information, we think this is binding to a second mode on the outside of the protein, not internally. We think that's really useful data for us to be extracting literally from an overnight titration of nitrogen proton HSQCs with increasing pressures. And we can go on now to new systems where we have no structural data at all. Here's one that we believe has a smaller cavity or smaller set of voids inside of it and small molecules as applied here. Again, fragments identified by compound screening lead to a reduction there. Again, all of these data are acquired trivially, overnight pressure series, nitrogen proton HSQCs, no chemical shift assignments done, and we don't need to have, quite frankly, an NMR expert to be able to go through and ask whether peaks are showing linear or nonlinear responses as a function of pressure. So this is one area where high pressure has been really useful to our, our research program overall. In the last few minutes, I want to switch gears briefly to talk about the second question. How can we buy a signaling point or impact the kinetics of the system that we have going back and forth here? Again, these are involving some, some things that are difficult to observe, especially the transition state, obviously, as we have here. To get into this, I want to go back into the ART system that I showed before. <clears throat> it has uh, approximately 100 cubic angstroms worth of internal cavities, several of which are hydrated, some of which are not inside of the protein. As part of a mutagenesis study on this, we ended up discovering the fact that a single point mutation could cause the protein to uh, go into slow conformational exchange with a second state. So for example, if I pull one diagnostic peak, I have a nitrogen proton HSQC shown here on the left. As we now introduce this Y456T mutant, we can see the protein splits into two conformations that are in slow exchange with each other. Other point mutations are silent on their own, but when we combine them together, we can now move the conformational equilibrium, frankly, wherever we want, from something that is virtually 100% back in the wild type state to something that's virtually 100% over in a new second conformer. So work done by then a graduate student in my lab, Matthew Evans, quite some time ago, addressed what that was. And what I'm showing you here is a bit of science fiction. It's a pi mole morph in between the two conformational states. What you're looking at is a five-stranded anti-parallel beta sheet on the outside surface of ARNT pass B. In one of the two structures, the native structure, let's stop the movie, let's go here. That's the native structure here. And uh, I've colored every other amino acid side chain blue, green, blue, green, to help underscore which are on the outside, which are on the inside of the protein. So in the wild type state, the blue residues are on the outside. However, in this new shifted mutant, they have slipped plus three in register. And as we all know about beta strands, which have a periodicity of two, an odd shift means that outside becomes in and inside becomes out. And so now all the green residues are on the outside. So, Notably, the cavity is present in the wild type conformer, but is filled in by this plus three slip. So that caught our attention. Here we have a trivial way that we can have a change in volume between two conformers that are in exchange with each other. Could we potentially by pressure be able to push the conformational equilibrium around? By the way, I want to underscore that I said that there's a conformational equilibrium. I haven't shown it before. In order to show it, uh, Matthew Evans needed three pieces of equipment. He needed a chromatography unit, 
he needed an NMR and he needed some good running shoes to take samples off of the chromatography and go throw into the NMR for real-time NMR experiments. So we went to one of those mutants where we had a 50-50 population equivalent between the two states. Chromatographically, we could bias the system by separating one of the two conformers away from each other. Matthew and his speedy shoes then would take one of those bias samples, throw it into the NMR, and we could monitor over time reestablishment of the original equilibrium as a function of time. So we know that this is a conformational equilibrium. Kinetics are quite slow, but I think it should escape no one's attention that what we're doing with having a large section of beta strand go in and out of hydrogen bonding with adjacent strands is a non-trivial change. So with that, Matthew and I developed a kinetic model for this where basically in order to interconvert between the two folded states, you needed to go through a chiefly unfolded intermediate. But again, that was really based on some correlations of kinetic rates and not a direct observation in any way, shape, or form of some feature of the intermediate state that would help, kind of in our opinion, seal the deal as to how unfolded it really was. I'll remind everyone from the introduction again, unfolded states tend to be the lowest volume of any, of any confirmation of a, of a protein. So that again suggested that by pressure, not only would we potentially be able to change the bias of the equilibrium between the two states, but we might be able to play some games with kinetics by changing some aspect that would be dependent on the volume change between say one of the folded and conformers and the unfolded intermediate. And this is where Jim Su came into the picture, um, working together with Jen and Donald initially to acquire initial data, but then really doing some very elegant work as part of his PhD thesis to prove this. He was able to go through to start with equilibrium steady state studies where we could go through and monitor by nitrogen proton or by carbon proton HSQC, changes in population between the two conformers of the system. And like I mentioned, the wild type state is larger than the so-called slip, the plus three slip because it has an internal cavity that this one does not. Consistent with that expectation, we could see that pressure led to a biasing of the equilibrium away from the wild type state over to the slip state. We were surprised in some of the high pressure NMR aficionados who are on the call today. One thing that really caught us by surprise here is that in order to model these changes in equilibrium properly, we had to go through and not only account for a change in volume between the two states, but a change in compressibility. Uh, for the non-high pressure experts, this is basically getting into aspects of the mechanical response of the system to the applied pressure stimulus. That has not normally been in our readings. And again, experts, please feel free to ping me or flame me as you, as you choose, either in the Q&A or by email afterwards if, if we're missing some things along these lines. But we have not seen traditionally a lot of um, changes in compressibility between folded conformers, especially folded conformers of the same protein, as being a major variable that needs to be looked at. Here we are seeing some changes in compressibility, which we think are related to the fact that one of the two forms of the protein is voidy, has, has voids, and the other one does not. With that, Jim uh, didn't want to do what Matt had done with this Rube Goldberg type device of chromatographic isolation and, and speedy tennis shoes. He instead took the dataless commercially available high pressure system and used it for pressure jump experiments, taking advantage of the fact that the kinetics on this system are quite slow. So you're looking at here a series of real-time NMR spectra, one carbon edited 1D proton NMR spectra are being shown. Time constant on, the, on this is roughly four minutes between scans. So we've clearly adjusted temperature in particular to be able to go uh, take a look at this trivially by just taking a commercially available pump, resetting pressure and watching in real time what happens. Um, I'll note, as I think many of you are aware, Adbax has gone into this area and has developed uh, custom systems for high pressure with much better time resolution than this. And we look forward to trying some of these experiments in the system over there. And with that, Jim was able to go through jump from various pressures to final set points. 
and monitor changes in the conformational equilibrium as a function of time. Notably, uh, kinetics are dependent on the final jump pressure that you go to, as one would expect. And this, and again, we have to use terms not only looking at the change in volume, but the change in compressibility between now the two folded conformers and an intermediate state. And these are, uh, again, consistent with this being a, a largely unfolded system that's got to go visit, giving rise to something that we have, have here. So we start off with a wild type conformer that's got the largest volume. There's a slip state that has a smaller volume. We have a un mostly unfolded intermediate state here. And then we've been able to unfold the system chemically. And we can uh, underscore that we know what the volume change here is as well. So we can get actually quite quantitative about how unfolded, mostly unfolded is. All of this I think is really useful. Again, as Art mentioned, I'm a big fan of physical chemistry. I like being able to see how this can be used to study a switching system like this. But from a practical standpoint, this also gives us insights not only into how we might be able to control some of this by mutation or small molecule binding in changing the equilibrium, but also critically the kinetics. A switch or sensor is no good to anyone if it takes minutes to hours to respond to a stimulus. We need things, for example, in a variety of biochemical and cell-based studies that respond much quicker than this. I think high pressure NMR is giving us some really great insights to be able to do so. With that, I apologize for going a little bit long. I apologize for the technical delays up at the front. I've tried acknowledging the people in my group who are responsible for this work, Donald, Jim, Roxana, and Jim. And I wanna again acknowledge contributions from Kazu Akasaka in discussions. With that, thanks. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Thank, thanks very much, Kevin. And I'll just put a plug in for the Structural Biology Center in New York. And it's NIH funded Center on Macromolecular Dynamics because Ad and Phil Anfernrue generously built Art, one of I'm the- I'm having pressure. problems hearing you. Hmm. Okay, that's better. Okay. Uh, the Structural Biology Center in New York and its Center for Macromolecular Dynamics by NMR now has one of Ad and Phil Anferrude's pressure jump apparatuses. Um, we're about to try it on some of Kevin's samples, but it's this is a facility available then to basically everyone who's interested, particularly NIH-funded researchers, but not strictly limited to that. So get in contact with me if we don't blow ourselves up, if you're interested in using facilities at the Structural Biology Center. With that, um, we have some questions coming in. First, can the effect of chemical shift be explained in terms of nonlinear viscosity dependence on pressure? <laughs> that good question that has not been something that we've seen as uh, a necessary component to include here again we have data across now uh, 50 to 60 systems where we're seeing uh, the again that general linearity um, the general linearity of the pressure response is not consistent with the viscosity effect but instead, we're seeing um, this mix of responses that are due more, much more to conformational aspects. Does the system contain voids or cavities or not? Great question. And on the biology side, what's your strategy for finding the natural ligand for the cavity? Yeah. So um, for finding a ligand for the cavity, we've used a variety of approaches here, ranging from um, taking advantage of the fact that uh, we can generate large quantities of some of these receptors, hang them on uh, the side of columns and build affinity uh, columns and flow a variety of different uh, extracts or lysates over those and look for what's differentially retained. We've also done a fair amount of looking uh, by, let's call it candidate-based approaches where we've gone through, we know, for example, in a pathway, what small molecules have levels that could be up or down regulated, for example, by enzymes that are controlled by those pathways. Uh, both approaches have been useful for us to go through and address questions such as are being asked here about the natural ligand. So Kathy Royer, uh, one of Hi, the ex real experts listening, 
makes a comment Agreed. that you don't change the viscosity very much in two and a half kilobar, and it's a complicated function of pressure can actually decrease a little bit with pressure at 10 degrees. Thank but you, her Daddy. question, her question is whether your crystal structures are cryo cooled crystal structures. Um, because she thinks of water-filled cavities as non-cavities since they are full and wouldn't contribute much to delta yeah. V. Correct. So uh, at this point, 90% of our structures are, of our crystal structures are cryostructures. Um, we have acquired some data to uh, at uh, room temperature and variable, variable temperatures along the way. Uh, a colleague of mine here at the SRC, Dan Keedy. Dan is an expert actually over in variable temperature crystallography uh, and has been great at helping us get into the area of it. So I like where you're going is that they're, the water-filled cavities are non-cavities since they are also, you know, since they could also be always be full there. Part of me is wondering what state that we're pushing up into for this second folded conformer to get the nonlinear chemical shift changes. Part of me thinks that what we've got here is the, the access to the transiently open state, like I mentioned, from molecular dynamics. Um, yeah, curious. We've mapped where the changes are occurring, obviously. And some of those data are, are consistent with this, but I'd like to get more information before talking more rigorously about it. Let's see, so there's a question. Oh, Kathy has answered or uh, followed up. In the kinetics experiment, if the observed rate is sum of forward and backward constants, mm -hmm. so the downturn you get might be manifestation of contributions from the backwards rate constant? I guess that's a question. Let's talk offline, Kathy. Um, I think it's not just the backwards rate constant that's occurring there. We are seeing, as we push that system up at two kilobar and above, we're beginning to see some destabilization. So I feel most confident about that at, up, at values up to about 1500, where we don't see a significant contribution from the back reaction. And a question, can Kleenex experiments help identify the residues lining the cavity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We've, in most of our systems, we've typically relied on uh, water protein NOEs as the primary way to do identification for residues that are occurring in a cavity. Um, I like where you're going with the Kleenex experiment to look for even more rapidly exchanging water. The thing that we are trying to push on here was really underscoring rapid ways that we might be able to prioritize which systems we do want to try spending more time and effort on. Again, going in with uh, very simple NMR spectroscopy, very simple analyses, very simple labeling, and uh, uh, no need for sequence-specific assignments in particular. Um, there's a question. How does your approach dovetail into mechanotransduction? That's a seminar unto its own. Um, suffice it to say that the changes in occupancy or changes in configuration over at the photoreceptor, there are enough specific protein ligand contacts that get changed that we're seeing beautiful things by uh, literally, you name the technique, we can see them by NMR chemical shift and uh, changes, dynamics changes. By X-ray crystallography, we can see um, conformational changes as well. Cryo-EM, there's the conformational changes being seen. But it, again, it gets back into a, what parts of the protein, what parts of the cavity in particular are interacting with the ligands in particular. There's a question about the effect of pressure gradients at high pressures. Oh boy, that's a great question. I don't feel like I have a good sense of reliability there. We are hoping in our systems that we are not getting gradients, especially across the length of the samples that are being used as, as aspects of, of potential heterogeneity. 
Um, I wonder about that Agilent magnet sitting down at 1100 bar is a good way to be able to go investigate that further. And that raises the question, what, what about higher pressures? You can't get there with the Daedalus system, but of course there are other systems. Right. Um, to me, the areas that our work is most interested in are those that are nicely within the sweet spot of the data less and commercial systems of really being able to push between the two folded conformers that we have. If you go higher at, again, three to four kilobar is where many proteins begin undergoing an unfolding event. I think folks in that community would benefit from and have used a lot of the higher pressure systems uh, they're oftentimes using biophysics other than just NMR spectroscopy as part of it. Uh, but uh, for the kind of work we're interested in, conveniently, we're, we're able to access it with the conventionally available commercial sources. And Kathy Nochi, here's a rumor that a four kilobar tube is being developed. Ah, that's way. Excellent. Um, and then I asked the previous speaker about statistics, so I have to ask you as well. Um, okay. What else did Donald think about for characterizing the distribution? The standard deviation is, you know, not the world's most reliable statistic if you have very non-Gaussian distributions. Fair enough. Um, we went with a variety of measures of breadth, uh, including total range, including, uh, you know, width at half height, basically, um, where we've had a lot of productive conversations with Akasaka in particular. His group had been working on averages, especially um, averages of absolute values. We felt that the breadth of the distribution is um, the most useful metric that we could get here, especially given that we've got signed values, right? Things can be breaking to the left or to the right. We wanted to make certain that we were taking a look at uh, ways to represent breadth of the distribution rather than just changes in centroid. That said, I'm certain that this is an area where, uh, I'm certain with uh, at least three sigma certainty that more work could be done. Okay, I think we've gone through um, most of the questions. Um, Ashish Aurora, for those who want to follow up, put into the chat a reference to a paper, The Effect of Pressure on the Viscosity of Water, Nature, Volume 215, page 1053, the year 1967, for those who want to follow up there. Let me thank Kevin again for a fantastic seminar and turn things back over, I guess, to either to Oscar to close things today? Yeah, so, so I think we again. can uh, close at least the recording session, uh, the official session. Just uh, mention that uh, we expect you next week uh, that we will have uh, Harry Madu and uh, Paul Shanda. And uh, yeah, and I also would like to thank uh, both the speakers today and uh, also this was kind of a, an incidental session in terms of uh, of technical aspects, so I, I, an extra thank to both of you for that.